Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and you can just call me Gene. I've been called a lot worse. <laughs> so we're going to talk about hot and cold extremes today, and it just got me thinking. Now, I don't know if anyone else is like me and my wife, if you're a married couple, or you notice this just in general with men and women, it seems that my wife can take the heat a lot better than I can, literally. <laughs> she can sustain hot temperatures for a long period of time. Like if she goes in a sauna or something, she can be in there for two hours. Me, 10 minutes, I die, right? So that's it, right? So I run a little hotter, that bothers me. But the cold, it's different. So she comes into a cold room, right? And it's like, oh, it's cold in here. You know, and I have like just a tank top on, shorts and sandals, I'm fine. She doesn't like the cold. I think it's an excuse to wear her Lululemon jackets, but that's, you know, if you guys don't know what that is, check your credit card statement, you'll find out. <laughs> so, so anyway, she, she can sustain heat. I cannot. But cold, I do fine. Cold pool, something like that, I usually just jump right in. I'm good to go. So it got me thinking about a story. Yes, there's always a story. And this is like partially a true story, maybe kind of mostly true, based on real things that happen. The Lusitania, where you're paying attention in school. It's a ship, 1915, got sunk. Think Titanic. I want to give you guys some context. What was the problem? Did you see the movie with Leo? All right, it wasn't named Kate, whatever. So <laughs> it's been a long time. So ship sinks, iceberg. What happens? So you either die from the initial water, right, whatever it is, maybe the iceberg, but then the rest of the people die, the heroes of the story, or characters, they die from freezing, or he dies from freezing. Spoiler alert, but you've had 20-something years to catch up on that movie, so I don't feel bad. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, freezing, freezing water. So here's what happens. There's this guy, Lord Joseph Duveen, real guy, and he's like an art dealer, like an art collector, and he's going back and forth, Lord Joseph Duveen, right, from London to America, back and forth collecting art. He has like art galleries, that kind of thing. So transatlantic, you know, boats. They're going back and forth real cold in the ocean in the middle there. So he sends an assistant, or he wants to send an assistant to go check out a piece of art. But he gets word that the Germans are looking for ships like this because they're saying that, and we're not going to get tangential here, but they're saying they're carrying a bunch of ammo. So it's a fair target. So we're going to sink it. So he finds out, and he says, look, I can't afford to lose you to this assistant. You know, they're going to sink this ship. You're going to get torpedoed by a German U-boat. He says, no, 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 no. I heard about it long before you did. So I've been training. <laughs> training to get torpedoed. That's interesting. And he's like, yeah, yeah, hear me out. Here's what happens, right? If I survive the torpedoing, then the ship's going to sink, and I'll be in the cold water. I'll have to deal with it. So I've been bathing in ice water. At first, I could stand two minutes, no longer than that. But I've got myself up to five, or two hours, he said, two hours. Okay, go ahead. So he goes on the trip. And as history records, Lusitania gets sunk. It takes the rescue boats five hours to get there. But when they do, He's perfectly healthy. Talk about discipline. So that will lead to sustaining hot and cold things. And you can look up the story. It's said to be true. Interesting. We find ourselves today, nope, no joke this morning. Normally there's like, he's going to, nope, not today. It's not funny. I'm just going to leave you in the ice water, treading water. That's it. You're just there. <laughs> we find ourselves in the rest of the story today. This is where we're looking at the full counsel of God's word. So even people who have been in church a really long time, they see some of these stories and they go, I never even knew that was there. So we're looking at all of it, the full context. So we're going to be here in the series for about another five years or so. There's a lot of it there. Before I begin, I want to thank Tony Johnson. We talked about selfless service, serving the way Jesus wants you to. So I started with just the attitude. We went to Philippians 2, right? Make your own attitude, that of Christ Jesus. So I started with the attitude. Tony got to the application. Service without the selfies, right? So don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So he did a great job. 
If you didn't catch the message, you can go back through our app. You'll be told how to get that later and watch it there. So a recap is in order. I'll go a little further back. So we were dealing with, right, First and Second Kings, Second Chronicles, the parallel chapters there, and we saw that there was a civil war. So if you've never really read a whole lot of that before, think King David. You probably know David and Goliath. His son, Solomon, said to be wise and wealthy, but he broke every single rule in Deuteronomy 17 set forth for a king. He wasn't actually a good guy. But because of his father, David, he didn't really punish him fully in his lifetime, but his son, Rehoboam, gets it, right? So he doesn't get it, actually, because he doesn't listen to his advisors. They have a split kingdom, think civil war, Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. And so what you have is mostly bad kings in the north, good king, bad king, good king, bad king, back and forth in Judah. None of the good kings are really all that good. And so we get all the way to the time of Josiah. And he was said to be a really good king, but we saw the importance there of finishing strong. He made a big mistake so that Pharaoh Necho, so there's different people attacking them, Pharaoh Necho could kill him, open the door so that he could, Pharaoh Necho, get his son Jehoahaz, take him away in chains. He installs Eliakim, renames him Jehoiakim. We saw Two Sundays ago, that that's where we were. We're looking at the interaction between him and Baruch, Jeremiah's assistant that nobody really talks about. And we saw that Jehoiakim had contempt for God's word. He's literally cutting up God's word and throwing it in the fire. So today we're going to continue with Jehoiakim. We're going to see some of the, the results of that. 2 Kings 24.1. During Jehoiakim's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded the land of Judah. Jehoiakim surrendered and paid him tribute for three years, but then rebelled. Then the Lord sent bands of Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against Judah to destroy it, just as the Lord had promised through his prophets. These disasters happened to Judah because of the Lord's command. He had decided to banish Judah from his presence because of the many sins of Manasseh. We talked about that in the past. I showed you this verse, who had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. The Lord would not forgive this. So we, now we get to the point where parallel accounts, really important, especially if you're here and you're going to preach on something, you need to read all of them. You need to read all of the accounts because they give you certain details. I've seen pastors get up and I can tell when they didn't read all of it because they'll make a definitive statement that just simply isn't true. So here we go. We're looking at 2 Chronicles 36.6. It says much the same thing in the beginning, but then it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and captured it. He bound Jehoiakim in bronze chains and led him away to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took some of the treasures from the temple of the Lord, and he placed them in his palace in Babylon. So we see here, you're going to see this kind of thing where different leaders, this is Babylon, not Egypt now, are taking these kings away and installing new ones, right? And they say, all right, you want that to happen to you? No. Okay, pay the tribute. And so that's what happens. And then they rebel. They don't pay the tribute. So the last three kings, this is what's going to happen. So you have Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, it falls. So we're getting real close to that point. So we talked about prophets weaving their way through these accounts. We saw Jeremiah. It was not in order, so that gets really confusing. How does the Bible work? By book type. Glad you asked. So you have the Torah, the first five books, all right? Kind of in order-ish, but then you jump over history books, Joshua to Esther, all right? So it's a little funny. You're like, okay, this is interesting, but then it jumps to your poetic books, Job, through Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, if you will, and then Isaiah to Malachi. And what happens is you have to take a lot of those books and put them back into what we're reading here. Sometimes just inserting them, okay, can we bring a chart up? Sometimes just inserting them in between two lines of scripture. We'll see that today. So that, we're not going to talk about that anymore because I've done the joke too many times. Bigger biceps, let's move on. That's what it needs. I didn't draw it. If I did, it would have them. So <laughs> anyway, tell the joke anyway, really, really fast. So here we see <laughs> in between two, two verses from New York, good at that. <laughs> so in between those two verses, you see three chapters of Daniel. Right, so this is the way it works. A lot of people don't know that. Daniel is going to span himself over a long period of time. So if you're reading this, Daniel's all the way over there. Like, <laughs> you got to put him back in. So I'm trying to 
unconfused and probably failing miserably uh, the Bible for you. But we're putting it in chronological -ish order. But here's the cool thing. When we do it this way, and for those who've been here for a long time, they really love the Word of God, and so this is exciting because they're like, oh, that's why, that's how. So we're going to learn something really important in the very first verse, just the opening of Daniel, the who, what, when, where, why for what's going on. So you'll understand, like, the whole point here. A lot of context. If you're new, too. Larger sections of Scripture. I'm not going to read it all to you. I rely on you going home and reading it yourself. I will paraphrase quite a bit of it for you so that we can get through. That's how we get through these larger sections. So I've said this before, do it really quick. The way people read the Bible is like, like watching three seconds or five seconds of a movie and turning it off and watching that whole movie over the period of like a year or two. You think you're going to understand it? No, you'll probably forget the beginning by like the second year. And that's how Christians read their Bible for the most part, unfortunately. Verse of the day, verse of the day, verse of the day, completely out of context. So what do you do? How do you remedy that? You look at larger sections so you can get how the story works. Then you zoom in after you understand what happened. <laughs> the problem is, you know, you just zoom in and you have no idea what's happening. And so you just apply the verse to whatever you want to apply it to. And so we talked about that gets annoying if you're a pastor. So <laughs> everything's always out of context. So larger sections for you guys. And here we are building a crew of people who understand, who actually know what this is all about and what's going on here. Daniel. So let's check it out. I'll just read it to you and then we'll get into it. Daniel 1.1. During the third year of who? King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in, his tre in the treasure house of his god, not a real god. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained, pay attention, three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So here is where I'm going to summarize. So you notice now you get the who, where, why was Daniel even there? Now you know, right? So it's, it's King Jehoiakim's time. He's taken away. There are also three young men. Daniel is going to span all the way to King Cyrus of Persia, long time, through the 70-year exile and all of that. So you have to imagine in this section, like, so we watch Daniel just grow up into an old man through the book of Daniel, just 12 chapters. Here, imagine him as a young man. A very, maybe he's a teenager, right? And he has three boys or young men with them. And if you've been in church for a long time, you had fun as a kid learning their names, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And all the kids say that, and so they just rattle it off. It's fun to say, right? But kind of interesting, just a little tidbit here. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are their Hebrew names. And when we talk about Daniel, we, we say his Hebrew name. But then we switch over <laughs> to the new Babylonian names and back and forth. It's confusing. We'll talk about other parts of the Bible that don't do that that you may have never read. Kind of interesting, but just a side note. Belteshazzar is Daniel's given name, and they don't really use it very much in the book of Daniel. So here's the thing, and I'm just going to summarize this as quickly as I can uh, without talking too fast. <laughs> what happens is they're going to be put through this. Think of them like servants or slaves, right? They've been taken captive, right? And they're, they're put in a service. They're going to train them up, and they're going to be close to the king. That's the point here. So they get proximity to the king. So you don't want anything embarrassing to happen or whatever. So they got to be healthy. they got to look good. But there are these foods from his own kitchens. And now if you're really familiar with the whole Bible, you'll know why they can't eat it. So if you go back to the law of Moses, you even go back to Noah. They're not supposed to eat meat with the blood in it because the life contains the blood. So this is with the covenant of Noah. And then it stretches all the way through the law of Moses. That's a problem. Think kosher. Got to dry it out. So that's going to be a problem if they're serving them their meats, stuff like that. 
If you go into the New Testament, it gets translated for us, meat sacrifice to idols. Right? So they sacrifice this meat. If it's been sacrificed to an idol, no bueno. It's not good. You're not supposed to eat it. So this is really the problem here. Right? So it's not about actually like losing weight. In fact, that's the problem. We don't want you looking pale and thin, it says. They actually want them looking you know, sturdy, right? strong, lots of protein in the meat. So anyway, that's the point here. And Daniel doesn't want to be defiled by this. So he goes to the chief of staff and he says, hey, can we just eat vegetables? That's all we want to eat because then there's no chance of you eating any of this meat. And he says, no, because if you start looking pale and thin, I'm going to get beheaded. The king's going to kill me. So Daniel's like, listen, 10 days. Give it 10 days and if we look good, then we can stay on the diet. Deal? Deal. Right, so says the chief of staff liked Daniel, admired him. So they do it and they end up looking healthier and stronger than everybody else. And when they finally get to the king, it says that there, so three years, three years goes by. We'll get to that later. <laughs> and they finally get to the king. He's ten, they're ten times smarter. Daniel and the three young men, ten times smarter than everybody else. That's where it leads up. We turn the page, Daniel 2, 1. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, switched the language in Aramaic, long live the king. Tell us the dream, and, he will, and we will tell you what it means. So, Here's the back and forth. I'll just summarize this part. The back and forth is that they're, think, when you say magicians, think magi, right? So you hear about the magi or wise men. You probably know that from like the New Testament. If you're reading this in the Old Greek, the Old Testament and the Old Greek, the ones that the, the versions that the apostles are looking at, <clears throat> it says the same word. It's the same word. It's like magi, magicians. So people get confused. They're like, why do they have astrologers, magicians? And stuff? Wise men, magician. Just summarize that right there. So they say, we can't do it. Nobody can do that. Like not even the gods, and they don't, they're not here among us. Nobody can do it. Nebuchadnezzar says, you must. So not only must you interpret the dream for me, you must tell me what it was. Am I going to tell you? So calling him out, like prophets, you, you got to be able to do this. And it goes back and forth about three times. We can't do it. Yes, you can, or I'll kill you. We can't do it. Yes, you can. So finally, he gets so enraged, his face becomes distorted with rage that he says, look, I'm going to have all of these magi, these wise men killed. Everybody's dead. Here's the problem. Daniel, the three young men, they're, they, they are like these wise men, these magi. So it means they're going to get killed. So his guy, the temple, the guard guy, Ariak, goes to kill Daniel. Daniel, uses wisdom and discretion, approaches the king and buys them some time. With that time, they do the most important thing that they could do. Pray. They pray. So he orders the boys. He's like, Daniel's like, listen, you guys got to get praying. We're going to die. So the Lord reveals the dream to Daniel. Daniel goes back to the king, and he tells him the dream, but he gives credit to God first. He's like, oh, can you tell me the dream? Like, nobody can tell the dream. God, who reveals secrets, will tell me the dream. That's, that's what's going on here. So he gives glory to God here in this instance. The long and the short of it, this is kind of funny, uh, people will get stuck here. We're going to keep moving. Don't do that. Just, just keep going, and then, like, at Bible study or some other time, they talk about the dream, and then, like, this is where people stop. So the dream just condensed is this. He has a dream of a big statue. It's a gigantic statue. The head is gold. Then it goes down to silver, the chest and the arms are silver. Then it's bronze, the belly and the thighs. Then it's iron, the legs, and then like a mixture of clay and the iron for the feet. What's going on here, just simply put, is that it symbolizes Babylonia, the gold, and then the successive kingdoms. I've read many commentaries on this, and some are kind of funny actually because they get it wrong, like they didn't study their elements in science because they're like, each one gets stronger. No. And that's actually in a study Bible. As a scholar, that's not true. <laughs> so it's a mix. That's not what it's about. It's a lesser value of each one, and you're going to see the success of, like, destruction of each kingdom. The most important part is that there's, like, this boulder rock from a mountain. It hits the feet, and then the whole thing gets destroyed, blown away, and then the rock that destroyed it all is the new everlasting kingdom. 
So this is either the church, because probably like the iron is Rome, represents Rome. Probably people just stop and argue about this. And then the clay, Rome, how did Rome like fall? Well, they got beaten from the inside out, right? All the other different cultures mixed in, but it didn't mix. Like iron and clay doesn't mix, and that's what it says. And so it's either the church takes over, right, in Rome, think about that, or it's the kingdom of God, the kingdom to come, which will never be destroyed. I kind of lean that way. But here's the thing. It's really funny. You, people will, I've seen this in Bible say they just get stuck there. And they'll spend like the whole night talking about that. And like, I think it's this, and I think it's that. It's like, oh gosh, you're totally, you're going to see today, if you stop there, you totally missed the point. Read one through three. Then when you have time, go back. And just don't argue about it. Just think about it and be open-minded about possibilities. So in the same way, we're going to move on. Daniel praises God after interpret, and then he interprets the dream. So here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, it says he throws himself to the ground. He starts worshiping Daniel. I always think that's kind of funny because in other places we see like men just go, no, 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 don't worship me. It, we don't know whether he stopped him or not. It doesn't say anything. Right? And he orders everyone, offer sacrifices to Daniel. All right? But the most important part, the king says to Daniel, Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this in secret. So he becomes a God worshiper. Right? So he gets like converted, but not really. We'll see Nebuchadnezzar is not too great. But he includes God into his like stable of gods that he has. So then what happens is, and this is very important as we go into the next and most famous section here, story. Keep this in mind. So here's what happens. He gives Daniel gifts, and he appoints him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. So you got to keep this in mind. And what he does is he requests that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they get appointed rulers like him. So they're in charge of the whole province of Babylon. Daniel kind of prefers to hang out in the palace. So remember that the three young men, they're out and about in charge of all the people as former slaves and foreigners. That gives you your context for three. And what happens? Chapter three. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messengers to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow down to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bow down to the ground and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three young men, remember they're devout, the diet, all that stuff, they're not going to do it. So, some of the other magi, let's write the wise men, they see this as an opportunity. Go back to chapter 2. If they're foreigners, former slaves, they're not one of them, these outsiders become the rulers. They don't like that, the other wise men. So, here's a chance. They're, and they even state it. Well, there's some Jews who aren't worshiping your statue. Really? Bring them in. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he gets really mad. He offers them one more chance. No. We serve a God who can save us. They know the punishment is going to the first. We serve a God who can save us from that. He can rescue us, and he will. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your statue. Even if it means death. So what they do is he gets so mad, distorted with rage, turns up the furnace, seven times hotter than it normally is. He gets these big, you know, warrior guys to tie them up, the three young men, and throw them in the furnace. But it's so hot that the people throwing them in the furnace, they die. They burn up. They're in there in the fire. But Nebuchadnezzar notices, look, look at that. I see the three men unbound. They're safe. And there's another one with him who looks like a god. So Nebuchadnezzar is freaked out. He goes as close as he can to the furnace. You know, the picture I'm looking in the door at these guys. He's like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. They come out. And it says that their clothes are perfect. They don't even smell like smoke. Unbelievable miracle happening there. 
Daniel 3.28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever the race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. So then what happens is the king appoints them to even higher positions than before. And so here's a cool exercise uh, if you really love the Word of God. Go and read Daniel 1 through 3. Oh, am I getting it right? Okay, you'd say something in the middle of this if I didn't. <laughs> we have fact checkers. Fact checkers. Important to enunciate because then it sounds like something else. Exactly. Like, Gene gained a little weight. Take a little note. And so. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> look at Genesis 37 through 50, the account of Joseph. It's interesting. A lot of this stuff is very, very similar. It's almost like a foreshadowing the Joseph story to what happens with Daniel. It's really neat. A lot of similarities. So you can nerd out with me on that. I do that all the time. But here's the thing. It all points to Jesus. Jesus is the other one in the fire. It's called like a Christophany, or like think of it like foreshadowing of Jesus, an appearance in the Old Testament of him. That's important. So traditionally, the angel is Jesus. And there's another thing traditionally about this story, and you got to deal with it when you get to Daniel. I've talked about this a lot throughout the series, so if you're new and this is, uh, well, it might actually throw you for a loop, and it did that to me. So I learned about this actually after pastor school, and I started doing what's like textual criticism. I started studying like uh, the text of the Bible. And what you want to do, right? And I just think it's like this in anything, any field, you know, related to your work. You, the water's purest, closest to the source. So what you want to do is you want to get all the way back as far as you can. This means learning original languages, understanding the cultures, and getting back to the oldest stuff, right? So you want to try to get back when the ink was wet. And you see something <laughs> that scholars, I will tell you this, they tiptoe all around this. You learn this, you know this in pastor school. Scholars are very aware of it, but they... They, they don't know how to really explain it to people. So it's a really interesting thing. So if you want to know more about it, you can go back to the beginning of the series. I had to do a whole big introduction, like an hour-long thing at Bible study and teach on this so that you'd understand. So we're going to stick with facts. The oldest copies of the Christian Bible that we have, facts, so like 350 A.D., right? I won't get into all the fancy names of the manuscripts, but I've seen them. The oldest ones, right, so closest to the source, complete copies are all in Greek, the New and Old Testament, because it's the Lingua Franca back then, not Hebrew. They actually railed against Jerome for going back to the Hebrew, the early church. So, uh, scholars like Augustine didn't like it. Stay with the Greek. That's the inspired translation. Now, in your Bible, if you open it up and you look in the Old Testament, anytime you see LXX, it's telling you we needed to go to the Greek version to get that. It has more prophecies about Jesus in it. And it's more consistent with the New Testament, right? So that's why I prefer that. There are versions of the Bible. The other fact, we see 11 to 14 more books of the Old Testament. That's what happens there. And you can see all the way up until the 16 or 1800s, these extra books were in there. That is a 1611 KJV for the King James only people. <laughs> so you'll see there's the prayer of the three young men. That's not in my Old Testament. Well, it was in your great-great-grandfather's Old Testament. It was in there since, like, the 1800s. We can get into why they were taken out. There's no theological reason. It's just they got taken out. So even Martin Luther, they're good to read. He included these, quote, apocryphal books in his German translation. They were all in there, again, until the mid-1800s. So they're okay to read. No debate about whether they're Scripture or not. I'm not going to get into that argument. If you believe they are, Orthodox believers do. I love you, right? So we're going to stick with the gospel. If you don't, Protestant believers, I love you too. And that's what being a non-denominational church is all about. We keep the gospel at the center, and we deal with facts. That's it. These are facts. I'm not, you know, coming up with this stuff on my own or making it up. So uh, that's a 1560 Geneva. I'm just showing off my Bibles. Uh, really cool. It's in there too. So the King James is not the first English translation, not even close. So if you're looking at what the apostles would have been looking at. 
if you're looking at the Old Testament of that day or the Old Testament of just like about 150 years ago, they parse it out there, but the oldest copies will not begin Daniel the way we begun Daniel today. Begin? Begun. I don't know. So anyway, it doesn't begin like that. It begins with a little novella, Susanna. And so you would read that first. All right? It talks about Daniel being righteous. Then you get into what we read. In the middle, chapter 3, you're going to have the prayer of the three young men, Azariah and the three young men. I'll just briefly go over that with you. And at the end, there's another story that's missing from most Bibles, Bell and the Dragon. And so I say, because think about it, if they're in there for 1,800 years of Christianity, the apostles are looking at them. Well, if they're not there now, they've been redacted. That's just the truth. So just interesting. But it's really interesting because they keep, remember I said the names get all mixed? They keep it more congruent. They use the Hebrew names. Really, really interesting. Also, Susanna, her husband's name is Jehoiakim. Kind of weird. But the prayer of the three young men, it's really similar to what we saw in Baruch, where there's like this confession, there's a petition for mercy, and then ultimately victory. That's what they're praying for. Then the three young men bless the Lord. And so it's like this, uh, like a psalm, where the refrain is, bless the Lord, all the things of the earth, bless, bless the Lord, the birds, you know, bless the Lord, the heavens. And it's just very repetitive like that, it goes on and on and on, just bless the Lord. They're praising the Lord for this great miracle. And so it's inserted right in chapter 3. So to our application today, let's go back to chapter 1. Fad diets. <laughs> Fad diets, chapter 1. So here's the thing. Uh, if you know me, and I'll keep this short, <laughs> you know that I was in the worship ministry first, and I was a musician. I haven't always been a pastor, so that's why, like, there's a spider tattooed on my arm that I try to cover up in case people don't know the context. So <laughs> I was a musician, did a lot of crazy things. I was also in the fitness and martial arts industry. I spent a lot of time there, about, oh, well, maybe 20 years, almost 20 years in that industry, right? So my job, <laughs> my job was to train fighters. A lot of professional ones. I've trained UFC fighters, all kinds of things like that. Diet is really important. And if you've ever been in the fitness industry, you know, I'm not lying when I say diet's like 80%, right? If you put sugar in the gas tank of a Bentley, don't do. It's not going to be a good Bentley anymore. It's no good. You need to put good things in there and fuel yourself with good stuff. Diet, 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 diet. <laughs> it's everything. Especially if you're a pro. If you're a professional fighter, if you don't make weight, you don't make money. <laughs> That's it. They don't allow you to fight. I've had this happen. I've had someone go to the world championships and be off by one pound. I said a lot of things to him that I cannot say today in church. So, <laughs> I may be thinking them. Anyway, really bad, okay? So, they don't make money. And some of these fighters at this big level, right, you're losing tens of thousands of dollars and you just train for three months. So, some of them are smart and listen to me. Others do not. Some of them do, like... The, the crunch diet or the fad type of diet. They come to me about, or they came to me about a week before the fight, and they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm like 15 pounds overweight. What do I do? Well, I put them on crazy diets, all right? And they get there. But as soon as they come off the diet, they blow up. And that's what fad diets are like, right? So here's the thing. You need to do it as a lifestyle. I was talking to a very famous fighter friend of mine last week. We were having pizza for lunch. <laughs> and he was telling me how he needs to make diet a lifestyle. Finally, after like 20 years of fighting, he's realized, I really hate it when I have to lose 30 pounds in two weeks, and they literally need to IV him back to life before the fight. Fin takes this guy too many hits to the head, takes this guy too much time to figure that out. And he's like, yeah, Gene, man, I'm just, I discovered, I'm just going to stay on a pretty good diet, so it's like five pounds. You know, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> when did you discover that? So they realize you need to make diet a lifestyle. It has to be a lifestyle. Like you, you can't just go on a diet. You just, it's never going to work. Lifestyle. So the Daniel diet. <clears throat> I'm sure some of you have heard this. All right, the Daniel. We're going to go on the Daniel diet. And we're going to do it for 10 days. Here's the thing. <laughs> if you want to be anything like these guys, you have to do it for at least three years. That's the Daniel diet. Vegetables. Three years. So the vegetarians are like, no problem. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everyone's like, shut up. <laughs> three years. You need to do it for three years. It's not about diet. In fact, they didn't really want to lose weight or look skinny or anything like that. It's about holiness. 
It's about setting themselves, not even leaving the door open a crack to break God's law, to be unholy. Not even a chance. That's what it's about. The diet is not about dieting, but the true faith, the discipline and holiness that come from true faith, not fad faith. There's a difference. Yet today, <laughs> I see people, if you've done it, it's okay. I'm not saying it's like a bad or good thing. It's just, it's funny. What I'm saying is, is the thought process behind it is ridiculous, right? So, yeah, we're going to do this diet <laughs> for 10 days, and you know what? We're going to claim we're all in. What? <laughs> you mean, what you really said, this is what a pastor hears, you're going to quit on the 11th day. That's what I heard. I'm only going to do this diet for 10 days. That's what I hear. So you're all in. Really? And here's how it connects. Question. Then, are you willing to go from the fad to the fire? They connect. Because you stopped reading in chapter 1. You needed to go and see what happened. It wasn't a 10-day thing, first of all. A lot of people don't know that. It was a three-year thing. And after that, they were willing to go from that, it wasn't a fad for them, into the fire. Think about it. Are we willing to go from fad Christianity, right, to Christianity as a lifestyle, to truly being on fire or in the fire? So we talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? Deny yourself, Jesus says, and I showed you the great redundancy with which he says this, deny, the prerequisites to following him. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, die for me. Then you can follow me. <laughs> That's what it says. You see, Daniel and friends, they were doing it as a lifestyle. They were willing to go into the fire for the Lord. And so we learn this when we keep reading. You learn that it's not so trivial. There are people all over the Bible giving their lives for the Lord because they knew there were better things waiting for them. It happens a lot, but you don't hear about it at all in modern Christianity. So I want to hop to 1 Peter. It talks about fiery trials. So the best commentary we have on the Old Testament is the New Testament, not Pastor Gene or any other commentary. The New Testament clarifies a lot of stuff. So we get to the New Testament how... Do the apostles say we should handle these things? Well, 1 Peter is interesting, and I'll give you a quick exercise. It would only take you probably about 30 minutes. So skip Friends or something like that, or Gilmore Girls, right? Something like that. Is that an hour? Skip that. <laughs> skip that and just listen to, you can do it through the Bible app, listen to 1 Peter 1 through 5. Absorb it. Listen to it. Hear it. They heard the word of God back then. Hear the word. Absorb what he's saying. Listen to it again if you need to. Then ask yourself, does it sound like any modern preaching? Do it. It's kind of interesting. When you listen to the Word as much as I do, I can barely listen to anything because it doesn't sound anything like God's Word. So they're going through fire, fiery trials. What's going to be happening or maybe was happening during that time, this is historical. Nero begins to think it's a real cool thing to burn Christians alive. That's it. Set them on fire. Because it's not good enough to send them, you know, to the lions in the Colosseum or get torn apart. Nah, let me light them on fire. Just watch them run around on fire, lighting up his garden. It said that this is how, like, that great fire was started. Right? Blame the Christians, though. Well, he set them on fire first. That's how it happened. It's bad. So Peter is writing to these people in a really horrible climate. The, the persecution is going to heat up, literally, now. So what does he say? Well, let's take a look at a little bit of it. First Peter 1.6. He says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show, will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. That's what they're looking forward to. Not anything in this world. So you see this theme of suffering all throughout. And it's not just this letter. It's all over the New Testament. The end coming. Chapter 4, 
just like Philippians, have the same attitude that Jesus had, who humbled himself in obedience to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Basically the same thing here. Living for God, then 1 Peter 4.12, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. So that, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. It sounds identical to Philippians. And that was Paul. A lot of redundancy here. It's cold. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you don't hear this too much in modern preaching. But it's all over the New Testament. All over the place. So, are we treating Christianity as a fad? Like the Daniel diet. Yeah, you've gotten into it. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But don't quit. When you do fad diets or things like, we're going to do this program, or we're going to just do this, or I'm going to do the Bible in this much time, you're going into it knowing you are going to quit. That's not faith. You never go into something knowing you're going to quit. You make it a lifestyle. Faith is the opposite. Faith is rejecting the gold statue in your life permanently. Permanently. Yet most Christians, they just put the gold statue on a shelf. I'll get back to that later. I'm just not going to do my gold statue for like 10 days. Faith is rejecting the gold statue permanently, knowing you're never... It, what happens to it? God's kingdom crushes it, it crumbles, and it gets blown away. I don't know if I said that before. It gets blown away, like chaff on the winnowing floor. It's what they used to do. I showed you this illustration in the past, right? I separate chaff from the wheat, the grain. Blown away. That should be your desire for every Christian, that your gold statue would be crushed by the kingdom of God and blown away. Done. We need to go from the fad to being on fire for him. And Jesus himself, as we get to the end of the New Testament, as we close today, I want to show you this. He calls for that type of faith. He does not want you, he'd actually just have you cold, off for him, or on for him. That indifference where the gold statue is, no good. So Revelation, prophetic book, but it opens up with the letters to the seven churches of that time, still pertinent to us today. Revelation 3.15, I know all the things you do, that you were neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And don't you realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments from me, so you'll not be shamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes, so you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. You hear what he's saying here? You're rich? Really? So you're talking about your gold statue? Really? You're poor and miserable. Buy gold for me. He's not talking about literal gold. The treasure is in me. The treasure is in me. Buy into me. So here's the encouragement as I close. The thing is, you will share the throne with him. You'll be victorious. You'll be victorious. So you have a prize waiting for you at the end. Also, through your trials, through your journey, he will be with you. He will never leave or forsake you. He is always there. Open the door of your hearts and let him in all the way. That's the key. So for the sake of time, I encourage you to read Hebrews 10. Just put it up on the screen really fast. But basically, Hebrews is all about don't go back 
to your old religion. They're Jews. They're Jewish Christians. They're being persecuted for being Christians, and so they're tempted to go back. So it's all about Jesus is superior to everything, everything in the law, the priesthood, everything. And note here, he's talking about the early days. Go back to the early days when you first started this, when you were on fire for Jesus, when you were being persecuted for Jesus. Think back to those days, right? Accept it with joy, it says. I mean, everything taken from you, accept it with joy. Why? You knew there were better things waiting for you. Back in the beginning, when you were on fire for Jesus, you knew there were better things waiting for you. Get back there. Focus on that. Stay there. Finish victorious. Don't love the things of this world. And I want to close with these verses, Hebrews 13, 5. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Remember the leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, no matter how hot the fire is that you're in. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen.